I just want to welcome everybody tonight. Uh, I think everybody who's on the call has been on the call before. So you can just throw us through the logistics, uh, Nicole. Um, and um, I think everybody on the call understands the rules uh, and how this works. So raise your hand if you wish to speak. Uh, you can put comments in the chat, but uh, otherwise we have a small group tonight. So raise your hand. We shouldn't be too, too many issues with uh, finding you out there. Um, and uh, I just wanna say thanks to everybody that's on the call. Uh, we really appreciate it as always. And uh, I wish we were all sitting around a fire with a warm cocoa in our hand, but perhaps not, but we do appreciate everybody. So with that, I'll welcome Lisa Bagalari, as to say president to uh, bring greetings. Thanks, Doug. Uh, so on behalf of the board of directors and staff, I wanna welcome all the member organizations yet again on the call tonight. I hope you're all safe and warm in your homes and on this snowy evening. Today, Saskatchewan saw its largest number of cases in a single day, a reminder that we must continue to do our due diligence in following the government guidelines. Sport has demonstrated that we are able to, to operate in a safe manner. We keep up with our commitment to participate safely to ensure this continues to be the case. It is possible that the increase in cases may have an influence on sport, and although not anticipated at this point, the provincial guidelines may change at any time. If they do, we will ensure that membership is informed and together we'll adapt accordingly as we have done over the last few months. Thank you again for continuing to join us on these calls. Your dedication to the game and for all your hard work is very much appreciated. With that, I'll hand it over to Nicole and we'll go over tonight's agenda. Thanks, Lisa. So tonight we'll start off with a return to soccer updates. Uh, so any changes since our last meeting last month? Uh, we're going to do a debrief of the COVID cases in Saskatoon, and Amanda and SYSI is going to talk to that as well. Uh, we're going to go through the member November member sessions, and then we are going to end with bylaw discussion. So as Lisa said, today Saskatchewan experienced its largest single day total of cases in one day. There are 190 cases today. Um, so that brings us up to 4,087 uh, cases total. Oops, sorry, I just got to let a couple people in here. So the return to soccer plan, our last update was on October 23rd. Uh, now that the provincial election is over, we expect updates more frequently to the guidelines. And we also added a revision history document on our website, which can be found right under the return to soccer plan. So that can make things a little bit easier to navigate. So changes since the last member discussion, masking. As you all know, masks are now mandatory in all public places in Saskatoon, Regina and Prince Albert. Uh, for all other communities, health officials recommend wearing non-medical masks outside of the home. Uh, this does not mean that masks are required for players while conducting sport. Um, they're not required during games or training for players. Uh, the intent is to have people in public spaces wearing masks, so that would be your spectators. Um, coaches are also now expected to wear masks, which I think most coaches are already doing. Um, and the business response team told us this week that coaches should be wearing true PP. E if they're participating in multiple mini leagues as coaches and referees. Um, so that means a surgical or medical mask and not a cloth or non-medical mask. And active referees participating in only one mini league are not expected to wear a mask during a game or training just like a player. Also, you've probably seen maybe some slightly confusing emails about playing in multiple mini leagues. Uh, there was a bit of back and forth there for a while. They told us it was prohibited and then they came back, by they I mean the BRT, and said that it is um, not prohibited, but not recommended. Um, so that hasn't changed since a few weeks ago. And then um, this is not in the reopened Saskatchewan guidelines. However, as we know, those guidelines can change at any time. And COVID cases in Saskatoon. So as you probably heard two weeks ago, there were three confirmed positive cases of COVID-19 within SYSI. Um, as a result, 
uh, too many leagues were shut down for 14 days and have resumed with no further positive cases, uh, which is a really good sign. And the business response team in Sasport uh, praised SYSI heavily and their zones members for the way they handled the situation with professionalism, urgency, and also discretion. Um, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Amanda to debrief the, the situation they went through a couple weeks ago. Thanks, Nicole. And uh, I wanna thank SSA for providing us this opportunity to help um, to share what we went through and any key learnings we may have had going through the process. So on Saturday, October 24th, 24th in early evening, we were notified of our first positive confirmed case. One of our zone members informed us and uh, we confirmed the case was legitimate and we had as much detailed information as possible. Some of the key questions or information that need to be gathered are um, asking what was the date of exposure to COVID, if known, um, the date of first onset of symptoms, the date of the test, the date of confirmed positive test results, and the date in which the participant attended any soccer events in the past seven days. So with this information that our zone was able to gather for us, the staff discussed through email and phone to determine the best course of action. Uh, some of the key learnings we learned just initially right from the get-go was that we need to have a plan in place for, um, for example, we had a safety officer assigned with one staff person. But going through it for the first time, it's likely not uh, reasonable to have one staff person deal with it. And right away, we were all on board and handling the situation through emails and phone calls. And, uh, but going forward, we will, we put in a, a plan where all staff will be notified through a text and we'll have a staff committee meeting to discuss the details within an hour of being notified to discuss as a group rather than have it on yeah. one individual to handle. Um, so from there, we contacted Public Health Saskatoon and we were notified by a call center receptionist that staff were unavailable to assist and that they would send an email to appropriate persons, but that we may not hear back prior to Monday morning. Prior to re having this confirmed case on a Saturday, we were unaware that Sask Saskatoon Public Health are not available to assist organizations with um, these types of situations. Uh, I think it's after four on weekdays as well as weekends. So having no guidance from public health was kind of a, a, a more of a challenging situation than it probably needed to be. But we, we determined that the best thing to do in the short term was to suspend the mini league for 48 hours until we were able to get in touch with public health Monday morning to determine next steps. From there, we also notified the SYSI president so that he was in the know. We notified the Saskatoon Soccer Center of the confirmed case, the dates of the exposure to the soccer center for cleaning purposes, and the dates, times, fields of canceled practices for the following day that were to occur on the Sunday. We sent out a specific email communication to those within the affected mini league, informing them of the positive case within their mini league inform them of the 48 hour suspension of their activities and their canceled practices for the following day and advise them to contact 811 for further guidance. We also sent out a general email communication to all SYSI registered participants so that they were aware of the positive case. In this communication, they were also informed that if they were in an affected mini league, they would, be, they would have also received a specific email. Um, specific to their mini league and if they hadn't received that email that the risk was very low and that the soccer center had received a thorough cleaning. So some of the key le learnings from going through this first confirmed case was that we recommend organizations have their template communications ready to go 
so that you aren't having to construct these in the moment. We were advised that public health would, as soon as we have our first positive case, call public health. They'll help walk you through the entire process. They'll provide you with the template letters. But since our first case happened on a Saturday evening, we weren't provided any guidance or template letters. So fortunately, we did have copies of template letters that uh, the school boards had been sending out to affected classrooms and just general communications if there was a case within the school. So we adapted both those communications, A, for our specific email to a mini league and B, a general communication to our general membership. We also sent our general communication to SSA and can you go back one, please? We sent one to staff soccer, our zones and communities as well. Okay, yeah, that's good. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah. The following morning, Sunday, October 25th, we contacted Saskatoon Adult Soccer with instruction to advise referees of the affected mini league, and we forwarded an update to the SYSI board, and a Facebook post went out and copied to Instagram. One key learning from this is that uh, we'll be notifying Adult Soccer and the Referee Association immediately so the referee can be notified sooner. And then Monday morning, we still didn't have any word or a follow-up call from Sask Health, Saskatoon. We called them first thing in the morning to follow up and we were told to call 811 for assistance. Then 811 told us to call Sask Health. And we became frustrated and called Sask Health Regina, where they told us to contact Saskatoon Public Health. We explained the runaround and lack of response from Saskatoon, so they gave us some direction to shut down mini leagues for 14 days. So Monday that afternoon, as we were uh, constructing our communication of the 14 day shutdown, we received confirmation of our second case within the same mini league. A specific communication went out to the mini league, uh, informing them of the second positive case, shutdown of their mini league from the initial 48 hours to the 14 days. And we sent out a second general membership communication uh, informing them of the second case. Later in that afternoon, um, we also had further concern for a potential third case, not yet confirmed positive. Public Health Regina advised us to also shut down that mini league as well. So from there, we sent out the specific communication to the second mini league, shutting them down for five days to allow for time to receive test results of the participant being tested as the mini league had games scheduled for that evening. At around five o'clock, we received confirmation of the third case being positive within that second mini league. So key learnings from this was that the 14 day shutdown begins from the day in which a confirmed positive participants first onset of symptoms began. The 14 days becomes a moving target if any other participants become positive within the 14 day shutdown. And if so, the 14 days restarts from the date in which the most recent participants first onset of symptoms began. On Tuesday morning, still no call back from Saskatoon Public Health, and they, had, they still haven't asked for game sheets or attendance records for contact tracing. In fact, they still haven't. They never have requested that information from us. We held a meeting that morning with the Saskatoon Soccer Center, Saskatoon Adult Soccer, and ourselves to discuss how the weekend went and to address any gaps in our communication to improve. And we shared our experiences and tips and recommendations with their two, or, with the two organizations. Um, and with the third confirmed case being confirmed after office hours the night prior, we then Tuesday morning sent out the second specific communication, went out to the second mini league affected, explained the first positive case and shutdown of their mini league for 14 days. And we sent a third general membership communication explain the third case. All three general communications were also posted on our website as well as Facebook. Key learnings from this is that uh, we recommend that organizations put in place a checklist of tasks and people to contact so that it's easier to handle the situation without risk of missing anything. For example, the referee on the, the Saturday night. 
it was just an oversight and we were we thought of it first thing Sunday morning and contacted adult soccer right away. Um, Tuesday afternoon, local media started contacting SYSI for comment. In terms of media, less is more. So focus on explaining the risk and safety protocols your organization has in place to mitigate risk. The quick shutdown of affected mini leagues to avoid further spread, etc. Have a designated spokesperson with key messages ready to go. In terms of a communication checklist, so SAFSC Health was the first point of contact where we're to contact for further guidance, um, which they proved to be of little of assistance to us. But going forward, we now know that if there is a positive confirmed case within a mini league, and if that person attended any soccer events while they were communicable, or which means with they attended on or after the date of the first onset of symptoms, then we shut down the mini league for 14 days. If a confirmed positive participant hasn't attended any soccer events, a shutdown of their mini league is not necessary, but advising mini league of the case and to self monitor is advised, and the affected participant shall not return to soccer until they are symptom free and cleared by public health to return to activities. Now, when SASC Health, when we, we did talk to them later on in the week after we shut down both mini leagues, and they were asking us who advised us to shut them down because um, the first and the third case were cases where they weren't informed that soccer was a risk group. So we actually only got, received um, a, a formal communication from them for the second positive case that we received. So that's something to note um, and to get as much information and to be certain that this, the participant has in fact affected the mini league prior to determining a shutdown. Now for us, we're kind of getting a lack of information or conflicting information. Public Health Regina did in fact say, just shut it down to be safe. And we feel that was the right decision for us and we're glad we went that route. In terms of facilities, um, facilities are going to want to know the date that any possible exposures occurred and, uh, and the fields so that they can do a deep clean of certain areas where the participant may have been that evening or if it was within the last 48 hours. With our soccer center in particular, they did a very thorough deep clean of every, everything eight feet up the wall and down any surfaces that could have been come in contact with anybody just to, it was the first case we had, so it was done very thoroughly. And those are the measures that they're gonna take if there are any further cases down the road. Uh, make sure you inform the referee as they're part of the mini league. If you have referees within that mini league, um, send out a specific email communication to the mini league affected. It's good to also send a communication to your general membership to show transparency and that you're on top of things. It, it helps them if they're in the know and getting immediate information from you, it will increase their confidence in you as an organization who is overseeing their safety. Make sure you also inform any of your member administrators. For us, it's our zone and our community contacts. And of course, staff soccer needs to know as well. Um, we also feel it's important to put the information communications on our website, our social media platforms as well just for getting the word out and uh, greater transparency. So I've kind of gone through all the key learnings through the slides, but this is a quick overview of all those key learnings. So create a checklist of tasks and people to contact so that you don't miss anything when you're going through the process. Have your template communications 
ready to go ahead of time so that you're not constructing them when you need to send them out. In terms of media, have your key messages ready to go and have a spokesperson. In terms of the 14 day shutdown, understand what that means, how that can become a moving target if additional cases uh, are confirmed within that mini league. And uh, also ensure that the confirmed positive participant what, confirm whether, that, whether or not they did in fact attend soccer events or not prior to determining the shutdown of your mini league. Um, did you want to take it from there, Nicole? These were kind of sure. media sets that you, that the SSA shared with us. For sure. Um, so these are some communication tips that we received from both Canada Soccer and the business response team um, to keep in mind if you do have to communicate a positive case to your membership. Um, so the first thing is think about where the information is coming from and that we're not gossiping. Um, so like Amanda said, at the first step, they obtained all that information as much as they could about the case um, to know that, um, to confirm that there was a case and that we weren't just engaging in gossip. Uh, it's important to protect the individual. Uh, privacy of the individuals, particularly their health info, is the most privileged info there is. Um, so you should not share any more details um, than necessary. and um, nothing that can impact their privacy. So nothing that would help anyone um, figure out who that player is, who so don't name their team or their club or anything like that. Um, they said to be reasonable and nice. Uh, it's recommended to not um, get into whether it's connected to soccer, but instead focus on the things that we're doing to prevent COVID-19. Um, so masking, social distancing, our return to soccer plans, things like that. Uh, the primary focus should be on the protocols um, you've taken for managing the occurrences and what you have in place for the operation of soccer in general, again, uh, and including contact tracing and your emergency response plan. And reinforce the messages that you don't want to send. So when it comes to the media, um, don't respond to their need to create a story. So the BRT responded to the delays that um, us and other groups have experienced from SAS Health. Um, and their response um, was that the Saskatchewan Health Authority is the authority in this space. Um, so their direction is the direction on this issue. Um, so if they say something to shut down your mini league, um, you shut down the mini league. Um, but they also said with the delays that they prioritize contact tracing to higher risk cases. Um, so especially with the rise of cases right now, um, they're prioritizing. So if there's only one case, that might cause a delay in communication. They also said that a positive case is not always high, high risk to the activity. Um, so that comes down to someone has a positive case and they haven't played in three weeks, that might not be a risk to your activity. Um, and a member organization can suspend play prior to be directed to do so by public health, um, just like what SYSI did. So what they said is it comes down to the source information you received and what you want to do with that. So you have to take everything you receive, um, all the communication and before you decide what to do. So public health is available to provide guidance. Um, it can be attempting to take immediate action right away, um, but you might not have all the information and you need to do so. So if you're stuck and you're not sure what to do, uh, you can reach out to us, of course, and you can also reach out to BRT and they offer their assistance in this area. So. Well, thank, thank, thanks, Nicole. Um, and just before the call, I. I before we get to this next piece from Swift Current, I just want to say thanks to Amanda and, 
the board, the staff, the zones, the membership in Saskatoon for doing such a professional and thorough job of managing those cases. And also really, really thank you for coming on to, to uh, share learnings. That's really important for us all to share learnings in this situation. So we're grateful, Amanda, so please pass those words on. And then I also want to thank Chad Stryker. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to questions for both groups. Once Chad has uh, had some commentary, so Chad is going to talk about what they decided to do in with current based on their current circumstances. So at this point, we'll invite Chad to, to jump into the conversation. Uh, good, e good evening, everybody. Uh, it's been an interesting, not even 24 hours since with current. Um, we were made aware last night that um, two of our schools in Swift Current had uh, COVID positive cases. And then from that, one of our, um, a couple, well, one of our players was deemed a close contact to the um, confirmed case and then attended soccer practice yesterday. Um, and as did a family member as well. Um, and so we, um, and then messaging came out that um, the schools would be going to distance learning in uh, two different grades in two different schools. And so our first messaging was um, that if you've been placed on online learning from your school, um, you need to be away from soccer for 14 days, the same kind of time frame that you'd be away from school. Uh, and then earlier today, our Swift Current Minor Hockey Association um, paused their programming um, just as a preventative measure. And so that kind of that kind of made us reflect a little bit in what we should do. Um, Swift Current being a small um, organization, uh, we're connected to all six schools in Swift Current, but also eight other schools in the surrounding area. And so our board talked about uh, the risk of being a super spreader, if you will, in the Southwest. And we decided to pause our programming as well. Um, we'll talk with hockey about um, their return to play a bit so we can do this as, as consistently as possible for the community. Um, I guess it's just, it's a kind of working along with the, with COVID really is running a race where you didn't realize that it started last week. And we're just trying to keep, a, keep ourselves ahead of this and not being blamed for what could be a spread throughout the Southwest. I think that's all I got to say. Thanks for sharing, Chad. Yeah, thanks, Chad. And again, thanks, Amanda. And we, it's a good chance for conversation and, and discussion. If anybody has any comments about to Amanda about their protocols and what they went through or to Chad for a new situation, we, we've, we've got a new phrase that we've heard for the first time, I guess, placed on online learning as it relates to shutting down soccer. That's, that's one we haven't come across just yet. So another one for us to consider and learn from. So questions from anybody uh, for either Amanda or for Chad. I see Rochelle's hand is up. Hi, it's uh, Rochelle here. I have a, just um, looking at how many different like COVID questionnaires there are between so many different programs. Like I know Hollandia, we're using the questionnaires on Team Snap, but it looks like we can now maybe update those. Is there has there been any discussion to have one COVID like questionnaire health assessment like consistent across all of Saskatchewan for soccer? Like I'm just finding that everybody has slightly different questions, and so then it's like, well, whose questionnaire? takes precedence over which persons and so it would just be nice to have one standardized questionnaire for soccer like has well, there been any discussion on that 
No, and thanks. So thanks for raising that, Rochelle. So of course we have that declaration of compliance, which is in the attestation, right? Mm -hmm. And then all, all the members have taken different protocols about what questions they're asking, what apps they're using, and etc. So that your question, I think, is probably pretty timely. We have not discussed that nor has that been discussed on SAS support calls or in conversations with BRT at this time. But that's something I think that, that could be helpful, uh, certainly. And, and, and we, you know, we're interested in what other people's thoughts are from the call here. Uh, um, Nicole and I were talking about a similar question this afternoon. Nicole, do you have any comments about that? Yeah, I would say everybody's is a bit different. And maybe we need to look at just going to uh, the SHA's um, assessment tool that they have online, the COVID screening tool that they do to, if you need to get tested or not. Um, I would say that would be the most accurate and current thing that we could use right now. And then it would be an online tool rather than paper copies, but that is, that's just a suggestion. Um, I know everyone's doing it a bit differently right now and some people have apps and that works well for them. Um, but I would say for the most current questions that that tool would be the most accurate. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah. Rochelle, it's Lisa here. What question stands out the most to you in the different questionnaires that you've seen that would make you think that, um, you know, the well, question, yeah. Well, um, I did like we had a parent email myself and Jordan um, in just I, I'd have to go back and look at the question but it was if you went by like our questionnaires the player would have been cleared but if you went with SYS as question the player wouldn't have been cleared so then that became where where like whose questionnaire or questions like, do you follow? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, do we say, okay, well, Hollandia, like you're cleared to play by Hollandia's like health assessment. But if you look at this one, you're not. Right, so in, in that scenario, again, I think the protocol, SYSI is the governing uh, organization. So ultimately they would have the direction. But yeah. I think Nicole's point is, is, is accurate that th in order to be, uh, consistent at the highest standard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly don't know what the specifics of your question ours are compared to the SHA assessment tool, but that, that would be the standard for sure that you should probably meet. So it'd be interesting to take a look and compare some of those tools, I suppose. But I think Nicole's uh, comment is probably accurate, but ultimately the guidelines should come directly as close as possible from the public health piece. Um, uh, otherwise, the governing organization should probably be leading that piece for its members. That, that's my, my thoughts on that. Um, is there other comments about that from anyone? And so um, if you, if you want to submit either of those to us um, or any of the ones that exist, for example, in Saskatoon or Swift Current, We'd, we'd be glad to take a look at them and then we can look further into the FHA and maybe that's something we should consider for this Friday communication, Nicole, is to, yeah. uh, to do a bit of digging on this and then see what we can put out on Friday on this. Yeah, for sure. Other questions or comments from anyone? Chad, um, just a quick comment. I want to congratulate you guys for your swift response. You don't have a confirmed case, but from your board's perspective, you, you took a proactive step to try to keep your community safe. Do you think you'll get any pushback from your membership or your participants on that? Or, or how are you feeling about that decision you guys have made here recently? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, probably the biggest pushback will be our and we're under maybe our older groups. Um, I'm not entirely sure, like being connected to education as well, we've always talked about that the school's not gonna give COVID to the community. The community will bring COVID into the schools. Right, and yep, yep. So part of that lens for me is 
how much we can we can stop the spread um, from a soccer sample point or how much we have the possibility of spreading. So that was the lens in which we made that decision. Great. People were upset. They're going to be upset either way, right? It's six weeks down the road and yeah. we did shut down and there's 180 cases connected to Swift Current Soccer. People are going to be upset anyway. So. Yeah, no, that's good. So, so you erred on the side of caution. Yeah. For sure. And question for Amanda. Um, obviously, you had to have multiple communications at various times at some, early on without too much information, and then you kept going down that path. Uh, I think you commented that you, your, your choice to be open and transparent was, was, was a good one for you. Do you have any thoughts about that process? I, I know that you were under some pressure to provide more information that people maybe needed. Um, any just thoughts about that process for you and your communication protocols uh, multiple times there? No, I think the only time that I felt pressured by anyone to give more information was the interview that I had with one of our local radio stations, but I just stuck to our key messages and, and uh, focused on our precaution protocols and all the safety measures that we have in place to help reduce the spread of COVID. For sure. And I think that's a really good point, Anana. Thank you for that. Before you go into any media scenario, they're always going to try to force you into, uh, they're going to try to write a story that might not exist and they're going to try to force you through multiple or repeated questions to answer questions. But when you're doing those types of interviews, you it's really important to pre prepare yourself to just give the answers you want to give and don't more, worry necessarily about the questions they want to ask. So, so that I think is something that uh, Canada Soccer shared with us and we've thought about that in the past. It's difficult at times, but uh, it sounds like that was managed pretty well, Amanda, by just sticking to the process and the safety measures and the protocols. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to thank you too, Doug, and other members of the SSA staff. You guys were um, very uh, quick to respond and provide any guidance throughout like the early week there when we were still handling the communication side of things. So thank you for that. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks. Um, just another one, Amanda, I guess is an interesting one. And this is, I'm hoping you have an answer. I don't know that you will. Was the facility itself ever contacted by Sask Health? You were talking about the, the, the surface cleaning and the significant protocols the facility went through, which is good steps, obviously. But were they ever contacted by anybody? I'm not aware that they were. Okay. Yeah, that's I think interesting. Yeah. Sorry, go, go ahead. I, I would wager that they weren't because um, Jody, the soccer center CEO, and I are in close contact, and I think she would have notified me of that, and she didn't. So I don't think they were. Okay. Well, certainly the, the thing that struck us, and that's why, you know, we got involved with BRT, and they were a little bit surprised too. And one of the things we did learn uh, that I'll share in the call is that uh, that – there is a, a, a priority of cases, so that's important for people to know. Obviously, your case, when you get in this situation, feels like the most important thing uh, to you. But, you know, you're not necessarily at the top of their list at, at Sask Health. The other thing is that there really is not much protocol uh, uh, for contacting the organization as much as the individual uh, that was initially uh, tested by public health. Would you say that was true, Amanda? Or did that change after a while? No, I'd say that's true. Yeah, they didn't prioritize telling you who who has a chance to have the most impact on safety. Obviously, the organization does versus the individual who was actually tested positive. They sort of put some pressure on that individual or persons to communicate to you rather than health coming to you. Is that correct? That's correct. But even the ones that we were made aware of yeah. that SASC Health didn't make us aware of. They were even a little bit like inquisitive as to how we even knew about them. Okay. Because it almost seemed like we weren't on their list to contact for whatever reason. And we were only, we were only informed of one of the three cases and that was a CC. We were CC'd on an email communication that went to the, the, uh, 
the team coach. So that wasn't even directly to us. Um, and I also know of a, another example of volleyball here in Saskatoon where there was a positive case on October, can't remember when the positive case was, but they were communicable and attended volleyball in one of our soccer centers on October 14th. And the volleyball coordinator wasn't made aware of it until October 28th. And the letter to him was advising him to have any staff or participants within that mini league self monitor for two weeks. And so they were, didn't know they didn't get notified until like, after the two weeks was over. <laughs> basically, on the last day of the two weeks, they were notified, and the soccer center was never notified. Volleyball contacted the soccer center, notified them, and that's why I'm thinking the soccer center likely wasn't notified with any of the SYSI cases either. Yeah, so thanks thanks for that, Amanda. So one of the things that I've done with the BRT and with SAS board is raised this notion that, again, we have a hierarchy. Saskatoon has teams, clubs, a, a member organization. Then there's the SSA, there's SAS board, there's BRT, right? So all those organizations can do a lot to help stop the spread uh, if we understand the information. And yet there didn't seem to be a clear protocols uh, with public health so uh, we do know that uh, because of some of the work in Saskatoon that we share uh, with BRT, they've certainly raised this at a high level with uh, SaskCal about how can they engage the organizations who also have a pretty significant role to play and make sure that uh, things go forward safely after. So those are some of the learnings from our side that, that working through this with Amanda and her team helped us to, to think about as well. And we shared a lot of that stuff with staff sports so others can learn. So. Is there other questions or comments for either Amanda or Chad tonight on, on any of the things related to the handling of that case? Or are they both just cases, I should say? All right, well, thank you for that. And thank you again to, to Chad and to Amanda uh, for, for uh, walking us through their scenarios. So Nicole, you can uh, carry forward with what we got next, thanks. Perfect, so we'll move over to talk about the November member sessions. Uh, so as you are probably aware, the member sessions this year have moved online. Uh, the first session has already happened, the managing your technical direction. Um, and then we have a few more coming up here. So I'm just gonna go into briefly what those are about. So the next one is on November 18th and it's leading the way um, LGBTQI2S inclusion in sport. Uh, so this workshop offers sport leaders um, the opportunity to understand LGBTQ phobia, uh, what it is and how it can hurt, hurt your organization. Um, it will go into policies and best practices, uh, language that you should be using and things like that. Um, so I've heard very good things about this organization. So I strongly encourage you to attend um, and it, it will be held over the noon hour, um, 11.30 to 1.30 on the 18th. And then the next one is November 24th and it's Futsal 101 for member organizations. Uh, so this webinar is intended for organizations that want to introduce futsal into their organization. Um, it will go over the fundamental rules um, and how you would go forward with setting that up. And then the final one is on November 25th in the evening and it's mitigating the risk of child sexual abuse. Um, so that's presented by the Canadian Centre for the Protection of Children. Um, it's a session that will um, tell you steps on how to recognize high risk behavior in situations. Um, you'll gain greater knowledge on how to prevent child sexual abuse and um, attendees will also be introduced to programs from Commit to Kids and Tools um, to help you to provide additional child protection. And if you're a part of club licensing or you're planning on pursuing club licensing, um, having a code of conduct to protect children is a requirement of uh, 
all the levels, I believe. So if you haven't started on that, this course might help you in that area as well. Um, but if you already have one, there'll still be key learnings. Uh, so I'll stop quickly, to see if there's any, oh, Mike Gramiak has a question. Yeah, um, Nicole, is that FTSL 101 the same webinar or same material that was presented, I believe, roughly a year ago in Regina, or is this a different, um, like, course or, or session? I am not sure. Doug, would you know? I don't know specifically either, Mike, but uh, we'll get that out to Octavian uh, and get, get some information. I believe he's been working on upgrading that, uh, but I don't, I don't know why, sorry. Okay. Yeah, we'll find out for you. Yeah, if you could let me know, that'd be appreciated. So, yeah. thanks. Right. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Doug to go through the bylaw amendments. So again, as we do each fall, we, we requested member bylaw amendments by October 26th. Uh, we had no submissions for membership this year. So the only bylaw item related to the AGM is, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, ask for if there's any input. Uh, the deadline, of course, for bylaw amendments for membership is December 15th, as per the requirements of the Nonprofit Act. Uh, but this year, again, particularly because of COVID, we haven't done much significant work. We were waiting for Canada Soccer. They've also withheld bylaw amendments this year. So uh, that delayed us a little bit. But uh, again, uh, because of COVID and the uh, various scenarios, uh, there's not much uh, to debate this year for us. Uh, so. We have the one amendment, uh, it's, it's two amendments that relate to one specific item. Go ahead. So basically all we're doing is adding language within the bylaws to, to notify that the format of the meeting can be, can be by electronic means, which has been uh, passed in legislation. And within that document that is shared on the website, the official, the language from the legislation is there. And the other piece is just a bit of language down below that talks about the board can then uh, determine the format, the date and time uh, to, uh, in, as um, outlined in the bylaws. So pretty straightforward amendment. Um, this amendment is not actually necessary because the legislation has uh, uh, been approved that, that determines that nonprofits can hold their AGMs virtually, but we want it to be transparent and uh, make sure everyone was aware of that bylaw amendment. So uh, we have various board members on and myself, if anybody has any questions about that. All right, thank you, Nicole. So I guess it looks like we're, uh, we're nearing the end here. So you wanna run through those last ones? We'll ask for questions at the end, Nicole, maybe. So our, uh, the fall member sessions, Nicole's already gone through those. So on the, the next session here would be December 8th. That'll be our last one before the new year. And just a reminder of the board nominations, the recognition and technical awards nominations, and of course, December 15th bylaw deadline nominations before Christmas. With that, I'll just open the floor. If there's any questions or comments to anybody uh, on any, anything, we're glad to talk about it tonight. All right, well, again, we wanna thank SYSI for their uh, thorough presentation and, and for sharing the learnings. Uh, also wanna thank Swift Group for coming on and talking about the scenarios they've gone through. Um, we'll get back to Mike on, uh, on the football course and make sure we clarify that. Um, other than that, I just on behalf of the board and on behalf of the staff, I wanna thank all the member organizations that came out tonight again. You guys are frequent flyers, so we really appreciate you being here. Uh, but before we close, I just invite any last questions or comments. Otherwise, it's a cold night. We'll wrap up and we wish you the very best.
All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you again. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Good night, guys. Thanks, Nicole. Good job, everybody.